Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. And I'm Matt Miller. We just got finished watching Jerome Powell testify. Mm -hmm. The Fed wants to continue raising rates. He does. He didn't bring up ETFs. No, not at all. Strange. All right, well, we'll, we'll cover that for him right now. We're going to get to the biggest stories in the more than $10 trillion global ETF industry. Uh, Powell testifying before the House saying that despite the recent pause, rates will need to move higher further to con to curb inflation. And fighting for a spot, BlackRock revives the fight for a spot Bitcoin ETF. And as it and others file for several of these products, there is, of course, resistance from the SEC. And all this month, we've been celebrating equality. Today, we're going to look at one ETF that's supporting women in the C-suite. And Matt, Eric Balchunas, sadly, is on vacation this week. So I'll be taking a look at the flows. Let's look at where money has been going in the ETF industry. We'll start with the inflows. You can see IVV up at the top. That is an S&P 500 tracking fund taking in about $2.8 billion. You go down the list, you have some credit in there as well. LQD, that, of course, is investment grade debt taking in a billion and a half dollars. RSP, we've been talking about this equal weight S&P 500 ETF from Invesco, Invesco taking in another billion and a half or so and also the financials seeing some love as well so those are the inflows let's take a look at the outflows uh, you have spy up at the top of course spy it's very liquid it's a trading tool so can't read too much into the outflows or the inflows but you can see it lost about four and a half billion dollars in the past week so did to the queues 2.6 billion dollars worth of outflows in the past week maybe some saying okay tech has come pretty far maybe we're at the top Top. And small caps, IWM, also seeing some money come out as well. But I wanted to steer, steal some of Eric's thunder since he decided to take a vacation. He's been talking about the FOMO drought, basically how fixed income ETFs have been taking in more money than equity ETFs. But that dynamic has finally flipped on the year for the uh, bulk of 2023. Now we have equity ETFs finally in the lead, taking in almost $10 billion more than fixed income. If you look back in March, you can see that fixed income really had the upper hand over equity, but finally stocks are back in charge, Matt. All right, very interesting stuff and too bad that Eric missed out on it. Uh, joining our conversation now is Anna Paglia, global head of ETFs and index strategies at Invesco. And um, what do you think, Anna? You know, it looks like investors are coming back into U.S. equities in ETF in the ETF world, of course, they've been driving up stocks um, in the market. Are they a little bit too late to the rally in ETFs? Hi, Matt. Thank you for having me. I don't think that they are too late uh, into the rally in a, uh, in a equity and the equity ETFs. There is definitely a story about equity. There is a story about the growth uh, coming back into the picture. And we clearly see that uh, by tracking our flows and tracking our assets. Uh, Katie has already mentioned uh, one of uh, the rebound uh, ETFs in terms of flows, and that is RSP. Uh, after a little bit of a pause uh, based uh, uh, mainly on uncertainty and uh, high drive of the mega caps in the S&P 500, uh, the story about diversification is coming back uh, and we can see that uh, with flows uh, into RSP. But we also see very positive flows uh, into growth, uh, innovation and technology. Don't be confused or misled by outflows uh, into the QQQ because we assess longer term investor sentiment into growth and technology by looking at flows into QQQM. And that product is up four and a half billion dollars year to date. So there is definitely a comeback of equity. It doesn't mean a fixed income is going away. I think that flows into fixed income will continue. We will continue to see that. But equity is definitely on a rebound over the last uh, over the last few weeks. You bring up QQQM, which of course has been a great success story for Invesco. I believe it's over $10 billion in assets. Let's talk about QQQJ because that's one of these Q-related products. Uh, it hasn't taken off to the same extent that we've seen QQQMs. Currently, QQQJ has around $722 million in assets after launching in October 2020. So when I think of QQQM, I think, okay, it's the NASDAQ 100, but cheaper. What's the pitch for QQQJ? 
Well, Katie, QQQJ is uh, the NASDAQ, let's say, 110 to 200. So for us, that is a mid-cap story. And uh, uh, you are right when you say that there has not been an uptick into flows into that product over the last couple of years. We saw very strong momentum when we launched that product as part of the innovation suite. However, it's not surprising to see a slowdown in flows because 2022 was not the best year for growth, especially mid-cap growth. We do believe that there is tremendous value into this product because it is a mid-cap story into a launch pad into QQQ. Stated otherwise, if you think about companies like Netflix or Tesla, they would have been in a QQQJ before, let's say, graduating into the QQQ. So if you are looking at following a company in their growth trajectory, uh, mid-cap growth is definitely when you want to start before you move into large cap and mega caps with the QQQ. I wonder if, you know, we, Anna, have been um, a, a little bit obsessed with the narrow of the rally that we saw in stocks for weeks. And, and now we've seen more breadth over the last month. But I wonder if it makes sense for investors to get into, um, you know, equally weighted indexes in order to profit off of gains from the rest um, and not have to worry about those that have already gained. Well, you, you know, you are raising a really good point. Uh, um, we we believe in the equal weight story when it comes to uh, RSP because we think that, that concentration matters. And when the growth and the revenues are driven by mega caps, uh, you want to look at equal weight as a, as a as a way to really remove that concentration risk. So it's uh, it's very much a defense story more than a revenue or a performance based story. However, not all equal weight products are created equal. So, for example, we believe in the stronger value of the QQQ because uh, the QQQ is more of a thematic product. So if you believe in the team of innovation, healthcare, technology, consumer, uh, consumer discretionary, uh, you really want to be in those stocks that are driving performance for that index. So we definitely, uh, we definitely buy in and we support the story of diversification when it comes to RSP. But if you are looking for a more of a team thematic exposure and laser tailored exposure to a sector or an industry, maybe equal weight is not really the way mm -hmm. to go. And we only have about a minute left with you, I'm sad to say. But I did want to ask, because if I look at Invesco's lineup right now, I see about 224 funds, only 18 of which are actively managed. And that's been one of the stories in the ETF industry this year is sort of this arms race for active. When you look at the white space in Invesco's lineup, do you see space for more actively managed strategies or do you see your bread and butter as really those index tracking funds? Well, Katie, that's a good question because, uh, so uh, let me just say that I think we are doing a disservice to our clients uh, if we continue to talk about products in terms of active or passive. We do have strong capabilities in the passive side of the house. We do have strong capabilities in the active side of the house. So as long as we can find value for what our clients are looking for, we will bring an ETF that address their their needs, whether that being active, whether that being passive or what have you, it doesn't really matter. But I do think that we will continue to build active components to our lineup as a com complement to the more rule-based passive strategies. All right, Anna, thanks so much for joining us. Anna Paglia there of Invesco talking to us about their lineup in these markets. Coming up, BlackRock makes a splash with its spot Bitcoin ETF filing. We'll discuss that next. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Katie Greifeld. 
Time now for the ETF Brief, where I walk you through the trends and the stories that caught my eye in the ETF industry. And we start with small caps. We're looking at IWM here. It's a fund that tracks the Russell 2000. You're looking at combined put and call open interest. Hit a record high this month. Of course, we know that small caps have been a really interesting space. We can see now that options traders clearly agree. Let's also talk about single stock ETFs because we're almost halfway through this year, through 2023. This is the best performing fund on the market right now. It's NVDL. It is one point times long exposure on NVIDIA, sitting on year-to-date gains of 360 percent. That's what happens when you combine the best performing stock with, of course, leverage that's been working out. We'll see what that looks potentially on the downside. But let's talk about the ETF story of the past week. Of course, BlackRock filing for a spot Bitcoin ETF on June 15th. This caught a lot of attention since, of course, the SEC has repeatedly rejected the structure. And of course, we're talking about BlackRock here, the world's largest asset manager that has spurred a flurry of similar funds. You can see Bitwise, Invesco and Wisdom Tree, just some of the issuers who have followed in BlackRock's footsteps here. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Okay, let's talk more about this with Athanasio Serafagas of Bloomberg Intelligence and um, I wonder, first of all, Athanasios, why the SEC has rejected all of these previous attempts. You know, what is the problem that they have with an ETF that um, essentially holds a basket of a commodity? They agree that Bitcoin is a commodity, not a security. Yeah, I think their whole issue was with surveillance, right? And it looks like this issue or BlackRock has figured it out. But I think also the previous filings had figured this out, too. But it's different when it's BlackRock, right? And the other thing is these products exist in Europe, so they know that structurally it works. It works in, in other markets and in Canada. So it, I guess it's just the SEC's hung up on it. But what I found interesting about BlackRock, they didn't file in Europe. All the other firms that have shown interest in crypto, Invesco, Wisdom Tree, all have done it over there. BlackRock sort of skipped that step and just went straight for the, the U.S. filing. Let's talk about the BlackRock piece, because I've talked to a lot of investors and analysts about this in the past week, and every conversation starts with, well, it's BlackRock. Why does that matter? What signal does that yeah, send? Yeah, it's just, like you said, they're the largest asset manager, right? It legitimizes it. Now, not to say that the other firms that did it weren't you know, legitimate or big, but it, this is BlackRock. They have access. They are you know, the kings of ETFs. And this reminds me a lot of what happened with fixed income. They weren't the first to try this, but they sort of perfected it, right? And when they stepped in, it completely changed it. So I think it draws a lot of parallels to what happened you know, during the early fixed income days. I was talking to an SEC, a former SEC lawyer yesterday who said, um, his main concern with the Bitcoin ETF would be settlement. He said he was concerned because of the volatility, but Bitcoin hasn't really been that volatile of late, right? It's been holding in a pretty tight trading range. Um, the days of 20% swings seem to be behind us. And if you have a behemoth like BlackRock in there, they surely could deal with settlement. Oh, I agree. And if you think volatility is an issue, look at some of the 3X ETFs or even, I think you showed a single stock ETF that was on there. That they're probably more volatile than some of the Bitcoin activity that we've seen. So there's, I think the market can handle the volatility. They've shown a history of being able to handle these types of products. All right, Athanasios, really appreciate your time. That is Athanasios Serafagus, Bloomberg Intelligence. Still ahead on this program, we're going to drill down into T-bills with Alex Morris. He is the CIO and Portfolio Manager of FM Investments. That's next. This is ETFIQ on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Matt Miller with Katie Greifeld. And we're back for today's drill down where we focus on one ETF. And the ETF that we're focusing on today, it's T-Bill. It's the U.S. Treasury three-month bill ETF. It's from issuer FM Investments. And as you would suspect, it holds T-bills, specifically three-month T-bills. It charts 15 basis points to do so. And uh, if we take a look at the holdings, so the way this works, again, it's what you would expect. It holds three-month T-bills. It holds the latest issued security of that tenor. We know that T-bills, of course, have been one of the hottest places to be as the Fed continues to raise interest rates. Cash actually pays something. So it's probably no surprise that if you take a look at the AUM, it has absolutely skyrocketed since this ETF came into existence. 
existence just last August. Only in existence for about 10 months is already it's over a billion dollars in AUM. And you can see otherwise than that blip that we saw in March. It's been a pretty steady climb and then it really took off up and to the right. So there's a lot of demand for cash. Matt, you have to think this is probably one of the best timed launches in the past few years. Absolutely. Katie, thanks so much. Joining us to talk more about this ETF is Alex Morris, CIO and Portfolio Manager at FM Acceleration. Alex, great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for coming in the studio. Uh, let me first ask you about this, um, I don't want to say craze, but there has been a real drive into fixed income ETFs. Do you think that we're nearing the point where that starts to turn around or at least plateau? Well, I know equity ETF flows are, are back, yes. which is good to see. E flows should be up in general. I think that fixed income ETFs are about to hit that next wave of innovation. Things that we did and really focusing on the on the runs and lots of other things I know our colleagues are up to that are going to re-energize that flow. Maybe not next month or two, but certainly in the next year. If you look at recent filings, a lot of really clever stuff out there, and, and we're happy to be part of that. And I feel like the yield on cash, it's sort of entered more broader conversations that you would have even outside of live television on Bloomberg television. You hear people talking about the kind of yields that they can get in cash. And when you look at the investor base, that billion dollar AUM, who is that from? Have you seen interest from retail or is that primarily professional money manager types? We've, we see most of it from the advisory space. So professional money managers, some other fellow asset managers like ourselves who find it easier to buy the ETF than to roll treasuries. Uh, but also a fair bit of retail investors who've reached out to us and said, you know, thankfully we're here because working with Treasury Direct is difficult or impossible at times. And now there's an opportunity for them to participate, not just in T-Bill itself, but in all of its suite mates in the benchmark series where they have a rates tool set, which before they never had access to. Explain for those who aren't you know, as immersed in fixed income as Katie is, the host of Real Yield every Friday at 1 p.m., what, what is an on-the-run security and what's the difference uh, or what's the importance of th that difference? Sure. So the, if you take T-Bell as an example, it's a 90-day bill, and the government will issue that about once a week, sometimes twice. So every week you pick up this new issue. So what you see on Bloomberg is the 90-day yield is the most recent issued one. That also happens to be the most liquid. So if you were to try to buy a 90-day T-bill, it's 45 days old, it's no longer the 90-day T-bill. That was a 90-day T-bill six, seven, or eight issues ago. The reason why you want that liquidity is the ability to trade in and out of it quickly and to not pay a large spread. No one particularly has much interest in aging or seasoned bonds. There's a whole business built around trading those. But for most investors, you want the security of knowing what you bought is exactly the yield you're going to get and the ability to know that it's liquid. So if you need to get out of it, you'll get out of it at a fair price. All right, I want to talk about what's next for FM Investments, because I look at your lineup right now. You have 10 funds with about $1.7 billion in AUM. Of course, T-Bill is up at the top, but then you see U2, which is your two-year tracking uh, ETF fund. I think that you cover the whole yield curve. Do you have any plans to expand into government debt or even outside the world of fixed income? So we certainly are going to continue doing some interesting things in the Treasury space. We've had a lot of demand for yield and spread plays, so long the, the 10 and short the 2, and a handful of other items that we'll look to launch. We have some credit strategies we've run for a long time as SMAs that we'll bring out to the ETF marketplace, uh, and then we'll see where we go from there. Certainly equities uh, are on uh, the table for us, but we really want to focus on things that we think will be innovative. It's a, ETF marketplace is pretty big. We want to make sure that we're going to make an impact and that we can provide some value to investors. When do investors start to focus on the longer end? Uh, now is probably a good time to look at it. We've seen a lot of investors telling us they're not reinvesting dividends in the short end of the curve. They're now taking those and putting them in the long end. You know, if you're a bond trader, you have a love affair with duration. We all do at some level. And I think more folks are going to see the advantage of that. But Chair Powell, even today, is making clear rates will be high for longer. So for the short, for the next little while, the short end of the curve is going to be safe. But as you look at long-term total return, you're going to want to start to put some chips further down field. And we see that with the growth of our 30-year fund, UTHY, mm -hmm. that came out and started to pick up assets naturally. And all of that was just internal demand from bond traders looking for duration. All right, Alex, got to leave it there. Really appreciate you coming to set and getting some time with you. Our thanks to Alex Morris of FM Investments. And before we go, as we celebrate equality this month, here's a special look at another ETF that supports women in the C-suite.
The Spider MSCI USA Gender Diversity ETF puts principal in investors' portfolios and trades under the ticker SHE. The fund seeks out U.S. large caps that commit to and support gender diversity throughout the organization, driven by research that shows that greater gender inclusion leads to outperformance over the long term. She ranks each company on three gender diversity ratios that take into account the percentage of female executives and female board members. Top names included in this market cap weighted fund include Amazon, Accenture, Apple, Johnson & Johnson, and Intuit. Since its launch in 2016, the fund has returned around 80%, which widely trails behind the S&P 500. She has around $200 million in assets. It started as a bespoke ETF created from one investor, Calsters, which invested $250 million at the fund's launch. The pension fund has since exited its holding. She has a relatively cheap expense ratio of 20 basis points and gets a green light in the Bloomberg Intelligence traffic light system with one warning for its alternative weighting. And a quick programming note, we will be back at our regular time and place Monday at 1 p.m. Tomorrow, speaking of she, right, tomorrow we have our focus on equality, uh, which is every Thursday at 1 p.m. this month with Romaine Bostic and Carolyn Hyde. Yeah, definitely a lot to talk about. Interesting, of course, to hear that on she. This has been sort of an issue with those ESG funds that you have one anchor investor, and when that anchor investor leaves, you're not left with a lot of assets. No, um, but you still see the performance there, um, and it's kept up with, although still trailing the S&P. Uh, if you type in a comp, you can see that. If you missed hearing from Eric Balchunas today, a reminder that you can listen to Eric and Joel Weber on Trillions. That's their bi-weekly podcast that covers the industry. And that does it for me and Katie Greifeld. This is Bloomberg.